Okay, before we have the slides, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about artificial intelligence. Uh, it's, been, uh, it's been taking off recently. Uh, and uh, if, you, if you follow the history of NIR, NIR back in 2017 started as an artificial intelligence company. Uh, moreover, the name itself, NIR, was referring to the, to the advent of AGI. It was the singularity that was supposed to be NIR. Uh, and um, eventually, I guess, we did not build the singularity. We built something else, uh, something cool. Uh, but uh, I never give up on the dream of building AGI one day. Uh, and um, as of last December, I started a new company, which will be announced in due course uh, with the sole goal of building uh, artificial general intelligence. Uh, and um, yeah, more, more news will come out later this year. At uh, today's presentation, once we have slides, uh, I want to talk about um, the state of AI today. Uh, how people build artificial intelligence in, uh, and how blockchain uh, is a very is a very fitting tool for many uh, things that people do uh, and uh, it is not being used yet for those things uh, but uh, um, it can be improved in any way so so let's let's wait for the slides well actually yeah. screw the slides um, okay so uh, if you wanted to build a large language model today, like if you wanted to build something like ChatGPT uh, or Stable Diffusion, uh, it builds on top of three pillars. One pillar is, uh, uh, is compute. You would need something on the order of 1,000 or more uh, of, uh, of a very specific, very expensive GPU from NVIDIA called A100. Uh, you would need, the second pillar is model architectures or research in general. If you want to push the boundaries, uh, you need the best people um, in the industry who will be building, designing the model architectures and pushing research for you. Uh, and today, research is entirely consolidated uh, in the hands of, uh, um, uh, of very few entities. Uh, and finally, you will need data. Uh, and you will need a lot of data. Uh, and I only have 15 minutes, so I will very briefly talk about two of them, and I will talk a little more about one which I'm particularly excited about. So compute. If you think about compute and your first and crypto, and your first thought is, let's, let's pull together compute from many people uh, and orchestrate access to it on chain, uh, you wouldn't be alone thinking that. I think that's a very, very natural application of blockchain technology uh, to democratizing access to compute. Today, however, it doesn't work quite uh, for a reason that for all the moder modern architectures that exist, you need extremely fast interconnect between the models, uh, sorry, between the machines. Uh, so people literally have infinite band between every, between all the machines in their clusters. And obviously, if you pull together compute from many, many people, that will not be the case. You will have regular network between them. So before we can do that, we need several more breakthroughs to actually make it possible to teach models uh, over slow network, and, and there's quite a bit of research happening, but we're not quite there yet uh, to start pushing it from, uh, from the blockchain side. When it comes to model architectures, today, oh, sorry, actually, there's something we can do uh, before we go to model architectures, and specifically, I think one interesting idea that is worth exploring uh, is to give up on the idea of having a decentralized compute cluster as of yet, have a fully centralized cluster from one of the hyperscalers, like AWS or Azure, uh, but build a DAO on top of the cluster that will be distributing access to it uh, to the community, right? So imagine like you're a researcher in one of the uh, smaller universities. You don't have access to compute. You go to the DAO. You apply for a grant. But the grant will not be in tokens or anything like that. The grant will be in compute hours. So I think that's a very interesting idea to explore. Uh, and that would, uh, that would be a massive uh, step forward in terms of, de in terms of democratizing access to to compute. So when it comes to model architectures, it's also very interesting because today, all the people, all the best people who are pushing frontiers of research are concentrated uh, in the number of entities which I, I can count on one hand, uh, primarily Google and OpenAI. Uh, but it doesn't have to be the case in the sense that if you compare research uh, in artificial intelligence to software development, for example, right? Like imagine you want to Imagine you want to make a meaningful contribution to the reference client of near protocol. 
before, before you can have any meaningful contribution, it would take you several months of reading the code base, understanding it, doing smaller um, work items. Uh, and because of this oh, right. commitment that you and the company that you, that you want to contribute, uh, the project that you want to contribute to have to, because of this contribution of time that needs to happen ahead of time, usually if you want to be contributing to some project, it would only make sense if you're ready to commit over multiple years. It is not the case with, uh, with research, because with research, if you want to be contributing to some project, you can come and go. Like You can join the project at any point, usually. You can, you can leave at any point. So there is no inherent commitment that you have to make to any of, the, of those entities. The big reason why people have to go to those entities is access to resources. So again, if you did have the DAO uh, that has access to, uh, that, that overlooks a large cluster, that could be a step towards democratizing Research and pushing the, the frontier. Yeah, you know, like okay, data. Data is the one I'm most excited about. Uh, the reason for that is that when it comes to computer and research, centralization is a problem, and I think centralization is holding us back. Uh, but it's it's the only problem. So m mostly, in a centralized fashion, everything works. When it comes to data annotations, everything is broken for everybody involved, whether centralized or decentralized. Uh, and, and I just want to walk you through today the, the problem of data annotation uh, and how it can be solved and, and also what has been done to solve it today. Uh, so generally, the idea is you're an entity, you're a company, you're a person, uh, and you want to teach a model to have some new capability. You want to have a machine learning model that, uh, given some input, uh, given some task that a human can do, would be able to do the same task. And the way you would approach it is you would have some amount of data, uh, that some amount of inputs for the task uh, that you want the model to be able to produce outputs on. But because the model doesn't exist yet, you will have humans uh, who will annotate those outputs. And then you will have input-outputs pairs that you will feed into the model. And hopefully, the model will pick it up. Uh, and so the way it works is that you go to one of the data annotation platforms, uh, and you supply the, supp supply the, uh, the inputs. Uh, and the data annotation platform will have a uh, set of workers. Uh, who work there, and each worker will get a few of those tasks, um, and they will annotate them with the correct answer, with the correct output that the model of the future will have to learn to produce. Uh, all the solutions go to the requester, uh, and at this point, the requester has the solutions, uh, and they go through them, all, all, the, all the outputs, they go through them, and they say, yeah, this output is good, this output is good, this output is not good. Uh, and depending on their verdict, uh, the workers whose outputs were accepted yeah. will get paid the Doesn't workers whose outputs were not accepted will not get paid. Uh, and there's a plenty of centralized uh, providers today, Scale AI, yeah. Mechanical, okay. Turk, right. Crowdflower. Cool. Uh, and in this setup, it is broken for every single entity involved. It is broken for the platforms, it is broken for the requesters, it is broken for the workers. Uh, for the platforms, it is hard because workers are usually distributed across all over the world. Uh, and so as a platform, you will have to figure I'm, out how to make payments you know, somehow out, to people time, you know, just get on the uh, in, in a lot of geographies. Something that on yeah, blockchain is just solved. On a blockchain, yeah. a user payment just work. Um, for requesters, the problem generally is that the quality is very low. So in Silicon Valley, AI is taking off right now. So like, if you go outside and talk to a random person, they are an AI founder. Uh, and all of them annotate data. And you can talk to them about their experience. And the experience is consistently disastrously bad. So all, if you use scale, if you use um, any of those providers, this, the quality is not good. OK, and um, finally, for the workers, it's the worst of them all. Because first of all, there's absolutely no support. If you do some work, and you're supposed to be paid one and a half dollars for it, support is not economically viable. So the, com the company like Mechanical Turk just cannot possibly have support, right? right? You, cannot, you cannot justify having people on salary doing support because the amount of money in question is just too little. Um, secondly, the requester who submits the work has the last say in whether you're getting, getting paid or not, right? So it is actually commonplace. It is something that happens on Mechanical Turk a lot where the requester will come have the data set annotated, and then we'll just auto-reject every single submission, keeping the data, and just not paying the workers, because they can do that. And in the absence of support, unless they consistently do that, it just works. And finally, payments are delayed. 
for multiple reasons. One reason is that if you, if you did some work and you were supposed to be paid two dollars, it's just not economically viable for the provider to send you the two dollars. It's too little of a payment. Uh, and secondly, even when you accumulated enough money to be paid, like you accumulated 20, 50 dollars, it does take multiple business days for money to actually arrive. So the gig workers, from, from the time the work was performed until the time they actually paid, it's a lot of time. Uh, and it, all of those problems can be solved with a single smart contract um, where you just change the model so that when the requester comes, the requester provides the inputs and a specification of the task in, written in plain English. Uh, and then the task is sent to some of the workers. They perform it and send solutions back. And instead of sending it back to the requester, the smart contract, effectively the smart contract implements a game between the, between the workers where they review work of each other. So it is, the task is then sent to review to some of them. They review it, send it back. Uh, and you need to design a game. And this is a very interesting uh, exercise in the game design where the workers do not converge to some sort of equilibrium where it's more beneficial for them to do low quality of work uh, rather than high quality of work, right? But if you do design this game well, uh, then the quality of work will, will be very high. Uh, and effectively what you do at, at the end is that you do not give the requester a say at all. So effectively the requester has only one knob, which is they can stop the data set. Like they can say, hey, as of this moment, do not give any more tasks to people. But for every task that was given to people, they have to pay, assuming the workers internally concluded that the high quality was high through the game. Um, right. Uh, so in this model, because it's a smart contract, first of all, payments are solved. Because the worker, the moment their work is accepted, the payment is just sent. It doesn't matter if it's 75 cents or one dollar. On the blockchain, the payment is cheap. Um, secondly, uh, from the requester, if the game is designed properly, uh, and I will talk about it in a second, the quality will be consistently high. And for workers, first of all, the requester doesn't have a say in whether the quality was high. It's the game between them that ensures that whether they paid or not. Uh, and as long as the game is designed properly, they will be paid whenever the quality of work is high. Uh, so they're not at the mercy of the requester anymore. And as such, the support is not really needed. <clears throat> uh, and finally, the payment's instantaneous. The moment your work is reviewed by the, by the others, which usually takes less than a couple hours, you get paid. Um, and there has been a very long-lasting experiment on Nier for the past two years around designing such a game. Uh, and it's been running it's been running extremely successfully, and for the in, in the past half a year, the quality of every task that was annotated in the, uh, on the platform was extremely high, significantly higher than you can get in any centralized solution, uh, with a very little cost overhead. So something I didn't mention is that the fee that the platform takes, like Crowdflower, is between 20 and 30 percent. So it's a massive overhead which is gone because there's no intermediary anymore. Uh, and uh, bef before. Before I conclude this presentation, I want to give you, um, I, I don't want to go very deeply into the game, design of those games. Uh, at, at some point, I will write about them. But I want you to give you an example of a failed game, of a game that was designed uh, and was considered by the designer to be completely foolproof, which within a week was completely broken, and people just, workers just completely uh, wiped out the, uh, the smart contract, took the money without producing any meaningful work. The, uh, the particular data set in question was a very simple data set. You, the workers were given an image and needed to provide a description. And the game was the following. The game was that um, given an image, the worker gets one of the three assignments. Assignment number one, they produce a description. Assignment number two, they get someone else's description and need to say whether it's good or bad. And assignment number three is called a honeypot. And the honeypot is necessary because if you don't have honeypots, people will obviously converge to, to providing garbage descriptions and always accepting. Uh, but, if, but if you do have honeypots, the honeypot is when a person has to intentionally make a mistake in the description. Now you cannot always accept, right? And so with honeypots, the game by the, was considered by the designers to be completely foolproof. Uh, and so this game was launched on the contract uh, that happened more than a year and a half ago now. Uh, and within a week, uh, the designer did look into the data set and observed that people are submitting complete garbage uh, and, uh, and they managed to get around the honeypots. And what happened uh, in, in reviewing, in, in effect do, doing the retro on what happened and trying to understand, what happened was that initially people would properly describe pictures when they're given a regular task. 
uh, and do some honeypot when they have to do a honeypot. But they quickly observed that if you do a honeypot, you actually don't have a motivation to do a high quality work because the task has to be rejected by design. Uh, and so several people, a very small fraction initially, started always doing the same honeypot, which says, hey, there's a Spider-Man on the picture. Um, and then, because people do review of each other, people who did not do that initially would notice that there's an easy way to complete honeypots by just mentioning a Spider-Man. And so more and more people over time would start mentioning the Spider-Man until effectively every single honeypot would mention a Spider-Man, at which point all the reviewers realize, hey, if you get a review, you can just say, hey, if there's a Spider-Man in the description rejected and then there is no Spider-Man accepted, and once that happened, people realized that if you write anything into the description which does not mention Spider-Man, it just does get auto-accepted, right? And so within a week, people would just submit complete garbage without mentioning Spider-Man if it's a regular task. They will submit something mentioning Spider-Man if it's a honeypot uh, and review the work of each other. And it was fully automated and the contract was depleted, right? So, uh, so the moral is designing those games is not that easy as it seems. Um, that concludes my presentation. Um, uh, overall, I think uh, it's an exciting time, uh, and generally, I don't think there is much happening today on the intersection of AI and blockchain, and so there are many, many opportunities for people to, uh, to start working on. So data annotation, I think, is one of the very um, lucrative opportunities. Uh, some idea around building a DAO on top of a massive compute cluster is another. Uh, so yeah, if you guys are interested in AI, uh, that's something definitely to consider as your next gig. Thank you.